Welcome back to the Untold Story podcast. Today we have David Rodari. Nice to meet you, David. Pleasure to be here. Uh, so I just want to start off by asking, you recently signed for Hastings United. Yeah. Uh, how has it been so far and what's your expectations for the season? Yeah, it's, um, it's been good being back home, obviously. I, um, last time I was at Hastings, then I got ball from a professional club and probably that's where I spent my best years of football and where I scored the most goals. So it's a new environment, new players. A lot have changed there, but so far it's been good. I've played a few preseason friendly and um, with the group we've got, I think we can really go far in the league, push for playoff, maybe for promotion as well, I think. So yeah, it's been good. It's good to hear. So Hastings is part-time at the moment. Just want to ask about what's the footballer's life like? What's the part-time training schedule like? Yeah, so we, when I was there before, we trained Tuesday, Thursday, where now with the new manager we got, we train on a Monday night and Thursday because he works in a university. He said to anyone there, because and because everyone is from London area, if anyone wants to have an extra session, and you know, during another day, we're always welcome. So I think eventually I'll start getting more session as well. So maybe three a week. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so when it's part time, you obviously have uh, more time outside of football to try <clears throat> new things and do other work. Yeah. So what sort of work are you doing outside of uh, Hastings? So I, uh, me and my flatmates, we created a company which is called Players Lounge. And we basically train semi-professional athletes and help them perform on and off the pitch and eventually obviously get scouted and become pro through training programs, nutrition advices, mindset advices, and help them show in the way that we did to obviously went from semi to professional. Yeah, perfect. And uh, you also have like a PT background, yeah. some PT experience. Do you think the PT knowledge and experience has helped you with your gym and uh, your like development in football? Oh yeah, definitely. I think as a part-time footballer, probably being a PT is one of the best jobs because you're firstly self-employed, so you can work whenever you want. And also it's kind of football related in it's like fitness, nutrition. And like I said, then also that helps you, how can I say, structure your training schedule, and obviously helping with nutrition and stuff like that. Yeah, perfect. So moving back to full-time when you're a pro at Crawley, what's the differences in um, between full-time and part-time apart from just training two times a week? Or what's the main differences? You know what? This is my sounds weird, but when I was at Crawley, when I was at Hastings before, we used to do two mornings and one evening because we had such a young team and the training back then with the manager we had was probably even better than professionals. And then going to full-time, is, was a bit weird because I was expecting to be a bit more like how can I say it? Um, longer session or even more structured session yeah. but in, in in fact it's different because it's about more just staying injury free and just working on basics and other stuff. What's the quality difference between part-time and full-time football? Uh, probably technically that's because it training every day of the players. Then you get players coming from higher leagues like the Premier League or Championship. So they know they've been in the game long enough to be that experience. They obviously read the game a lot more than non-league. Uh, what advice would you give to someone playing in non-league that's trying to go pro? Uh, I will probably say to mainly stay injury free, but that's coming from experience from me. And yeah, just look after every details, basically. So whether it is nutrition, your mindset, and your training. Yeah. How did it feel for you when you was getting your first pro contract at Crawley? Yeah, it was unbelievable. I, I couldn't believe it just because I came from two ACL injuries. And both times I was really close to getting a deal. So... I couldn't believe it, yeah. You mentioned the, the ACL injury. How like does it affect you mentally? Um, going from like playing football every day, doing something that you love, to 
all of a sudden not playing and then having to deal with such a long, hard process? You know what? The first time, because he was so new to me, uh, I didn't really, it didn't really affect me as much because I really, I, they're all the rehab process and what I've learned not by, by not playing football, like it, it grew me into the person I am. Obviously, it got me into reading or listening to podcasts, stuff that I've never done before in my life. And then the second time, I think it was a lot harder just because I knew the process that I had to go through again. But then obviously, luckily, lockdown came, so no one was playing and I, and I could just focus on that, really. I just want to ask out of my personal interest, because I'm coming back from an ACL injury, how long did it take um, the first time and the second time? First time, I came back after seven months. At six months, I did an MRI scan saying it was all good. The knees were strong. I'd done every test. I just had to, obviously, because you can't, it's one of those things that you can't really force because it's just, it's just timing. Yeah. So your ligaments will grow eventually in time. And the second time, eight months. Yeah. Both, both quicker than me. But it's not really, um, it's about like confidence as well. Uh, yeah. Oh, com- yeah. Confidence plays a massive part. For example, I've had physios tell me you're ready to move on, but I'd, it's not being scared. It's more about confidence, you know. Yeah. Well, it's, it's um injuries are tough, tough thing to I deal f- with. I think it's it depends on the person really as well. Because obviously, I was lucky I could do a rehab program of three or four hours a week, uh, a day yeah. with this private physio that I knew from Switzerland. But then when I was at Crawley, there was a guy that done his ACL, and he they didn't let him come back after um before twelve months. Like they literally wasn't allowed to. But that's maybe a reason why I did mine as well. It's the second time. That could be also a reason. What advice would you give to someone that's um, just just found out that they're going to be out for a season with an injury? What advice would you give to them? I'll probably say to you, not focus so much about what happened, but how you're going to spend your time while you're out. Like... Use it as wise as you can to learn new things. That you might not have that time anymore afterwards. And going back to when you were signing your first pro deal, what was that first season like as a pro? It was good. It was, I was so, like I said, I had adrenaline in me that I wanted to play. It was locked on as well. So I was out because non league stopped for a few months. I was just training on my own. Then I got signed. And uh, yeah, I think I made about 14 appearances and it was really good. I, it was tough just because obviously going from step four at that time, Hastings, to League Two, it was a massive gap, you know, playing against ex Premier League players. So it was tough, but I really enjoyed it and I got a goal as well, which made my season. Uh, what's the process of going on loan uh, and finding a new club? It's, um, I think, f- the second, the first time it, it was a bit. Like, I didn't want to, but I think I needed to because I was coming back from an injury. But the second time, I went straight to my manager and asked if I was in his plan. And that's, I think, what every footballer should do, especially if, you're not, if you don't think you're in the, in the plan of the manager and stuff. Like, there's no point wasting your time just sitting around and waiting and waiting or just training. Because, like, you get more of a chance being scouted or seen by other teams by playing and no matter what level really because even step one and two now are like you get full-time clubs so football is just changing exactly yes do you think loan moves are beneficial for young players that are trying to break into the first team but they can't get that they can't get the minutes yet do you think a loan move is beneficial for them yeah definitely yeah yeah, yeah. like like i said you get experience you get games under your belt because training for a whole year doesn't give you any benefit or any fitness level and stuff like that. And like I said, you can't really get seen. So I think I think every young player that can't break into the first team should go on. If it was me, I'll go alone. Yeah. Going back to your first pro move, joining yeah. Crawley, uh, you had manager John Yems, a very qualified coach. What sort of things do you pick up from these experienced coaches compared to like maybe a less experienced coach? Yeah, yeah, I think. It, him as a manager wasn't, I, I didn't think he was the main coach as he was, he was really good at uh, player management. So he was really good at speaking to you, probably motivate you as well, where 
on the other side, we had Lee Bradbury, which now the East League manager, he was the assistant coach. And I think he was the one where I picked most things from as obviously he was an ex Premier League striker. So he, he just told me like how, obviously I knew how to move as a striker, but he just gave me a few tips and obviously what to do when you um, come up against different kind of defenders. So you just touched on it there, the advice that you picked up from Lee Bradbury on your on your striker um, <clears throat> development. So obviously you've got other players, other strikers in the team that maybe had more experience than you at the time. Did you uh, used to? Did you watch them and analyze them and try pick a few things from them? Yeah, yeah, especially the first year when I was actually playing and being on the bench. Where even on the bench I was just looking out. We had Ashley Nadzen, which now is a Gillingham, and Tom Nichols a Gillingham too. And I was just looking at their kind of movements, what they did off the ball, on the ball, you know, when they weren't involved in so much. So, and I think I did pick up a few things as well. And even I used to watch other team strikers as well, because we did come up against some good strikers in League Two. Yeah. In your opinion, what makes a good striker and how do you become better? Well, firstly, scoring goals and... I think it's not so much being involved a lot in the game, but it's more like the little moments, like those key passes, goals, assists, like all those kind of moments. I think that's what I believe makes a good striker. It's just, it's a bit like Haaland. He doesn't really get much on the ball, but when he gets on the ball, he does score or he gets a key pass. So I think that's what makes a good striker. And I would probably say to become better is to watch Premier League strikers more similar to your type of style and uh, just study them, see their movements and what they do. The FA Cup debut, Crawley versus Bournemouth, what was the experience like playing in a, you played away at Bournemouth, what was the experience like playing in a like big, lovely stadium with yeah. better players? What was that like? Yeah, it was, it was crazy because obviously I was coming from Raman South, playing VCD away, to then go and play in Bournemouth away in the round. I don't know. I don't know what round it was, but I think it was quite far. And I just I remember just coming out from the bus, having cameras everywhere because obviously it wasn't TV. It was just it was good. Like I didn't even feel nervous just because I was so excited to play on that carpet. Like it was just unreal. Is there any differences in the training schedule, uh, match prep, uh, when you're prepping for a League Two game and when you're prepping for a big cup game? Uh, Does the gaffer plan different sessions? Is there a different approach to the game? Well, from a League to a cup game? Yeah. Not really. I think when I was at Crawley, we always played, we always prepared the same way, obviously depending on which team you'd come up against, we would do a different tactical session and stuff. But if not, yeah, I think we'd, we always prepare the same. I f it was a bit more relaxed on cup games because the league is what it matters. But obviously, we still wanted to win in the cups or go as far as, as far as we could. What's the main difference between a League 2 pro and the, and the Premier League pro? I reckon is a lot a lot comes in your head, like Premier League players are a, a lot, they're just more smart on the ball and I think it's obviously fitter because they have the better facilities, better recovery tools and stuff like that, better coaches, not all the time but yeah, I think that's probably the only difference, just the way they play, the way they see the game, the way they read the game really, they just read it better. So you're a professional footballer when you signed for Crawley. So now you're on the FIFA game. Mm -hmm. What's it like being on FIFA? And did you use your FIFA card a lot? Yeah, it was, it was a dream first because that's what every kid dreams of when they're young is to be on a uh, video game, especially FIFA. Cause it's so famous. And obviously I played it all my life. And yeah, I did, uh, I did use it to be fair because... When the first year I was in it, they put me five star week for it. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. To be fair, I, I can't remember because I'm <laughs> joking. Um, yeah, I just couldn't believe it. I was like, a League Two player with a five star week for it. And 
I don't really, I don't really play FIFA like career mode or pro clubs, but I did try and use it obviously against my teammates, my flatmates when I played friendlies with them and stuff. So yeah, it was it was really good. Yeah. Going back quickly to loan moves, uh, you was on loan at Worthing just before the season finished, and uh, Worthing achieved playoffs. What's the playoff experience like for a player? And uh, yeah, what's what's the experience like? I think well, that's what every footballer wants to experience at least like a promotion in their career and stuff. And obviously, even being in the playoff is unbelievable because you playing for something important. You always get big crowds as well. We, we got about three thousand last year against Braintree, and it's just. Yeah, like you feel the pressure, but that pressure <clears throat> is good. It makes you play. It can make you nervous, but for me, I always like. I always loved playing like in big games and stuff. It's always what, always what I wanted to do, and always wanted to prove and you know impress people on the outside. There's a lot of pressure on on the players uh, in big games like like a playoff. So how do you deal with the pressure? I think what I do personally is just. I don't really. I I do think about the game, but I try to. I just stay relaxed and just um, self talk to myself like oh, it's gonna be good and stuff. But oh yeah, I just prep it normally, and I just the way I see it is. Um, how can I say it? like? I just love impressing people in big occasion. Like I just play like. I've got nothing to lose as well. So. And your game day routine, can you talk me through your game day routine? Yeah, so normally I wake up about, even on a Tuesday night or Saturday, about 10-ish, maybe just before 10. I have my breakfast. Normally I have uh, scrambled eggs on sourdough, a bit of avocado, a bit of fruit on the sides. Take my vitamins. I take my electrolytes, hydrate myself. I... Not so much on a Saturday, but mainly on a Tuesday when I get a bit more time. I do a few stretches, five, ten minutes of mobility. I use my Terragun on where I feel a bit tight. And that's it really. Then I just chill, watch a bit of TV, watch some videos on YouTube about, like, you know, games or Champions League games where, like, it pumps me up a little bit. And then, yeah, just add to the game. You, was, you were on loan at Dorking Wanderers. And Dorking Wonders have like a camera crew. Yeah. They're filming them, a bunch of amateurs. They're also on YouTube. What's it like when you're training, moving around the club, and there's constantly a cameraman that's like filming what you're doing? Yeah. You know what? Like, you actually don't, you don't feel like there is someone following you. Like, even games, when I play with them, I never really look out where the camera was. Sometimes, obviously, I'll just look around just to see where the ball is and I see a cameraman there, but it doesn't really like affect you so much, but it's quite like, it's quite good obviously, because then you watch your clips back on YouTube and you know, it's, it's quite good, yeah. So I'm guessing you watch some of the bunch of amateurs videos or? Yeah, yeah, yeah I do, I do yeah. actually, I love them. I love, Richie's the main guy that films, I love <clears throat> the way he talks and introduces videos and stuff. And uh, the manager is so funny as well, so. Touched on the manager, Mark White, uh, <clears throat> owner and manager. How like uh, Dorkin have had a massive quick rise yeah. um, in, in <coughs> football. What sort of uh, what sort of expectations does Mark White have of his team? Because he seems like a very ambitious man. Yeah, you know what he's actually like. Many people think he's not a good manager, but I think he's so clever and his game management. And his tactics, he's always spot on against the other team. He sees the game really well. So he doesn't really do much training sessions. He doesn't take up the training and stuff because he's got other coaches. But during the game, he's the main man, which will, like, he would, he's the one that guides you for the tactics and stuff like that. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> I think you, well, he did say he wants to bring Dorking Wonders to the Premier League in, well, I don't know, many years, 10 years. But I do think in. Five years, there will definitely be like a league football side, especially now because they've gone full time as well. So. so, you played in Italy, you've had youth experience in Italy. What's the football like over there? 
it's very different. It's very tactical, not so much physical. Technical, um, technically, is good as well. Uh, I think it's probably more technical than England because obviously England is just fast, fast, fast. And um, yeah, it's just a different game. I think the main difference is probably tactical wise. So can you just tell me what clubs you've played for in Italy and, and what you've done over there? Yeah, so I was at Inter Milan when I was nine, I think, eight, something like that. I was really young. And then I signed for a club called uh, Novara, which when I first joined them, they were in the third division. And then in, I think they went up to the first one. They stayed there for a cup for three or four years. Uh, I stayed there for five years and then I, I think now they're probably in the fourth division. And uh, then I signed for their rivals, Provercelli, which were in the second division at the time, now in the third. And I was with them throughout the academies. Then I got released and uh, I went to a club in Switzerland called Team Ticino, which is a selection of like the best players around that area. Because Switzerland is divided in different areas a little bit, like um, county, kind of. And mainly because it was a full-time team, it was under 18. And uh, they were playing against the main teams in Switzerland as well. So like Basel, Grasshoppers, all, them good, all, all those teams that played in the Champions League and stuff like that. And then after a year and a half, I just, I was speaking to my family, mainly my brother and I, like, I've always wanted to come and live in England. It was always my dream to live in London because I just love London. And I think it was also a good way to grow as a man, leaving my family and live on my own or with a family that I didn't know. And also I could learn, um, I could learn to speak English. Well, in, the Italian language is not really like well known. It mainly, it's mainly in Italy. So that was the main reason then I came to England, yeah. You mentioned uh, you got released by a club. I just want to ask, how do you deal with being released? And then, so say when you get released, how do you find a new club? Yeah, it's... It's tough because even this year <clears throat> I got released by Crawley. They didn't obviously renew my contract, and even then, like I didn't think I would have to drop down to this level to find the club. So it's it's tough, but I think the main thing is just make sure you go and play where you're comfortable, but comfortable in a way that you play at your best. So your confidence is at the highest level and you know you, you've got no fear and you know you're going to play as well because by going to a higher club and sitting on the bench doesn't benefit anyone going on trials <clears throat> and the pressure of going on trial for a club how do you how do you deal with that pressure and um what should you like what advice would you give to someone going on trial you know what i even now if i had to go on trial i'll probably still feel pressure myself but i'll probably say make sure you speak to your teammates like so you can be a bit more relaxed when you play with them and um I'll, I'll probably say just play like you normally do and don't overdo really so when you left Crawley this summer uh before let's say you didn't join Hastings and you was looking for another club maybe in league two uh would you and they didn't put an offer for you would you have to go on trial somewhere to try to get in? Uh, well, I think it depends on like, obviously the connection you got. If you got an agent as well. Uh, but normally when people see you, you got released. They Some coaches contact you through, I, I've i used a lot of Twitter to get managers numbers, you know, managers names or people that know me like that. But, um, yeah, I think you see you still see players going on trial, but it's probably about who you know and you know if you know coaches, you can speak to them and then obviously see what they can offer you and stuff like that. So you came to the UK at a very young age. How did you find the club <clears throat> uh, initially when you first came over? How did I find a club? Yes, that's quite. Int uh, so I was in Italy before I left, and I emailed about fifty teams for our championship to Conference South. Not Premier League, because obviously you need to be like scouted together, even in the championship, but because I, I didn't know English football as much, obviously I took my chances. And then I got a few responses to be fair. The, 
which I only found out a few weeks later when on trial at Eastbourne Borough, that I had Northampton, that they said I could have gone there for a trial, which but I didn't know what league were they like, what was the leagues like. So I went to Eastbourne Borough and after three days of trial, he just said to me like, we'll sign you in pre-season, which the manager then was my Hastings manager back in the day. Eastbourne Borough, you went there for the under 18s, yeah. am I right? And then you <clears throat> progressed into the first team. I did, but I couldn't play because of my international clearance. Oh, right. I've, yeah. I've had a similar problem with the yeah. international clearance. I Personally, I went to Turkey to Altenor the Fair Car, and they, I went there, but I was 17, uh, 16 and then 17. And basically, you have to be 18 to like get a playing license yeah, yeah, yeah. abroad. So I, all year I spent this training. So oh, no, that's I know, that's what I did came, for six I months. Back. I was just playing friendlies yeah. and training. Yeah, it's a difficult process. You also mentioned that when you were moving over from Italy to the UK, you sent those emails out to clubs. I think that just shows me how determined you were yeah, to, yeah. to just like make it in football. Because I I was released by Yeovil Town when they were relegated to the National League. And I remember myself doing what you did. I messaged loads of, emailed loads of League Two clubs and... Uh, yeah, National League clubs, their academies, trying yeah, to get opportunities. So. I think there's nothing wrong with doing that. Even like sending coaches messages asking if they need a player or anything like that. There's nothing wrong with that because like, what's the worst that can happen? They say no. But what if they say yes? Oh, yeah, we need a player and stuff like that. So I think you just have to take your chances, really. Yeah. When you uh, got that like opportunity to go to the first team from under 18s to the first team, uh, how how is it stepping into like, from a young men's yeah, change room yeah. to a grown adult change room? How is it? So I was, obviously I went to Hastings after Eastman Borough. That's where I got my first years in men's football. And yeah, it was the main the main like different was probably physically because I went from playing people of the same age. Some of them were maybe physically a bit better. Uh, other uh, other ones were really small and physically differently, and then you play against men where like their strength is a lot higher. So I think that's probably the main difference between academy and men football. Yeah, so I, I'm young. I'm asking for myself now. Um, I'm I'm going to be going into my first year of men's football. So I'll, uh, what advice would you give to me, 18 years old, never played men's, but going to try go now? I'll, I'll probably say to just. Like, obviously, you will expect a lot more physicality in the game, but just use your strength to play against them. And then, yeah, one thing I would say then what I did is just any tackle as well you get, just go for it. Like, because obviously, if you show them that you, you're up for it and you, you don't mind having a battle, they will actually, they will think like, oh, cool, he's actually like, yeah, he actually fancy it. Yeah, you you like earn that. their respect. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, yeah, there respect. We go. yeah that was it. Um, so, words. what advice do you have for a player going abroad or trying to trying to go play some elsewhere? Yeah, I'll probably say to like obviously save up some money because you just never know if you have to come back or what you're gonna expect to. What's it gonna be like when you get there if you? be able to find a job or get paid straight away from football and stuff. But um is a is a good is an experience that I'll probably recommend to anyone. And if it was me, I'll do it again if I could. So just yeah, just be prepared. That it's gonna be tough. It's gonna be lonely as well, because you're gonna be away from your family. And uh but also that will grow you into a man that will make you more responsible. And it's more like I think you learn how to survive. Because obviously, when you live with your family, it's different because they, if you're in a tough situation or you need help, like they're obviously going to be there for you. Even if you're abroad, but obviously, being in a different country is just you. So you just have to basically live for yourself and survive. That, that, that's the way I saw it. Personally, uh, from your experience, what challenges did you have to face when you moved over? It wasn't so much being homesick. I think I, I did feel homesick after a year or two, maybe. Like there were days where I was a bit like, especially when I was sad or because I couldn't play football. 
and stuff like that. Or maybe I had a bad session, or, you know, I, I don't know. I wanted to speak to someone, obviously. I couldn't speak to my family face to face. But if not, probably speak English as well. I came and I did, I did knew a few words, not so much, but I couldn't stand the conversation with anyone. And I think mainly as well, like, because I was obviously Italian from abroad, people didn't really take, like, jokes on me, but obviously you, you can see, like, they see you differently because you're from, you're from different countries. So that was probably a challenge where I just had to, you know, ignore them and, you know, show them actually who I was and stuff like that. At the start of a season, do you set yourself targets and, yeah, for, for the season? Yeah, yeah, this season I want to score at least, obviously if I want to get my name out there, I want to score at least 20, 25 goals, no matter what league, even in this league where I am now, because it's got a lot tougher. It's the same as the conference. So, like, teams have dropped down levels, clubs are paying more money, for players, so players are going to drop from higher levels. So yeah, probably 20, 25 goals. Involvement as well, actually, if that's assist as well. And I'll definitely want to get, like, I want to be in a team where we fight for promotion. So Hastings, obviously, is one of them. And if I had to go somewhere higher or another team wants me, it would definitely be, you will have to be a team that wants to play for something, yeah. Hastings is fighting for promotion, playoffs. What's the difference between, apart from technical ability, what's the differences between a, a playoff team, a promotion team, and maybe a relegation team? Is there mindset differences? I've never been into a relegation team. Oh, well, I was at Crawley last year when they just survived, but I wasn't really there because I was a, I was a Dolphin and Worthing alone. So but both teams got to the playoff semifinals. I think is is mainly like a mindset thing where... Being in a relegation team, obviously losing every week, you get like your body language changes. You don't feel as confident and stuff like that. Where if you're in a winning team, like I remember, obviously playing for Dartford and Worthing, we just came to the pitch every game and we knew we were gonna score and win all the time. And even if we were like, we had games where we were two 0 down or one 0 down, and then we came up on top all the time. I think the main difference is probably mentally. I ask everyone this question, and just in simple terms, could you tell me how do you become a professional footballer? It takes time. It takes a lot of hard work. And uh, I think you should always stay hungry and never get satisfied. Because one thing I would have changed in my steps going to call is before Crawley, I was training every day, probably too much sometimes, but obviously because I was young, I wanted to become a professional footballer. And I think it's me- when you then make that step to, like I said, don't get satisfied, just keep training, keep doing what you're doing even more. And uh, mentally, you have to be an animal, I think. Yeah, because obviously you're going to come up against players like, Ex Premier League, and obviously they're gonna play like to basically kill you, kind of that kind of mindset, like a killer mindset. Last couple of questions: What's who's the best player that you've played with or against? Oh, played with it will have to be. I was on trial in Millwall when I was a tin, and I played in a like a training game with Tim Cahill, that he could be the best I played with. And against the ones that really impressed me were, uh, I'll probably say Sp- Spira. He was the next Liverpool player. He played in the Premier League for Liverpool and he was a Trauma Roberts at that time. Yeah, just because he was so, the way you read the games in midfield was just a joke. Best, mm. best club you've played against? Mm. Oh, I'll, put, I'll have to say Bournemouth, yeah, just because of really the ground and, you know, the atmosphere there, the stadium. What's your favourite footballing memory? Footballing memory? Uh, yes, I've got it, actually. Yeah, it's after my first ACL, 
I was yeah, coming back after seven months back to Hastings. We were, I think we were in the top, we were top of the league mm-hmm. just by one point or two maybe. And we were playing BCD away. That was my first league game since my injury. And um, yeah, I was on the bench. I came on last 20 minutes and we had to win to obviously stay on top of the league and carry on the form we had. And uh, I came on and after 10 minutes, we were new new and I scored like with my left foot in the top corner. Like it was like a half bicycle kick, kind of. And yeah, like, obviously, it was just emotional because all those months of grafting and hard work then coming back on the pitch and scoring on my first game and then help Hastings get into the playoff that year. So, yeah, that was probably my best memory just because of what I've been through, that's why. Perfect. David, really appreciate it. Your, thank thanks you, for your time. I thought it was a really good interview, podcast. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Karen. Cheers. Going to be out on YouTube, episode three. Um, like, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.